Howdy folks, Steampunk Desperado here. This week we have another of Desperado's anime picks. And this one belongs to that wonderful category, historical fantasy. This particular series concerns a vampire plague in Tokyo in the 1920s, and it is called Mars Red. researching the Meiji era, my mind immediately went to this anime, which I had started about a year ago and never finished. For whatever reason, I'm not sure. But I was thinking it belonged to the Meiji era because of the way the people were dressed. But I was wrong. It was a little bit after that. It was Taisho, the next era, which is a lot similar because it was an era of great change in Japan. Still, you have the Wonderful style of that era. You know, the contrast, the mix of Western and traditional Japanese clothing. You know, the presence of things like steam locomotives and so on. The introduction of European culture, such as European plays. In this case, there's one by Oscar Wilde. This anime was based on a play, believe it or not. It was a play written by a guy named bun o Fujisawa, and it was actually never produced in the normal manner. It was just done as a reading. And it was later made into a manga, and then in 2021, it became a series, an anime series. And it only had one season. So the plot revolves around a vampire fighting unit. <laughs> created by the Japanese government. They're called Code Zero, and they're part of the army. And they're there to combat the vampire threat. The thing is that it's still not officially recognized that the vampire threat exists. So a lot of people will say in this anime, they'll say, oh, vampires aren't real. <laughs> but this particular squad exists. And so it's really cool. There's a lot of features in this anime that I really enjoy. So what's really cool is that these vampire units, they're fighting units, but they have to read this particular speech to the vampires whenever they encounter them. And they kind of give them a chance to surrender. It's reminiscent of the Miranda rights in America. Vampires, there are two roads open to you. One, obey us, special forces, unit 16, and you will receive blood and registrations. Two, refuse to obey and we will end your blood lines here and now. It's awesome. I just love it. It's so official, so Japanese. So back to the general general category of vampire fiction. This is probably like the 10,000th work that's been done since uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula way back in the 1800s. Um, yet they managed to make this one pretty interesting. You know, there's different aspects to it. There's a subplot about conspiracies within the military, and there's also some other plots about you know, a journalist and an actress and, you know, a couple, you know, relationship things that make these people more real. You know, it's it's kind of a human humanization of the characters. Now, the vampires in this series follow most of the classic lore. And it's like a disease that people catch by being bitten. But not everybody gets it. A lot of the victims die immediately and just stay dead. <laughs> But the ones that survive, the disease makes them ageless. And the sunlight, yes, it's deadly. It burns them up. They go poof, you know, they kind of flame on. Anyway, they cannot change an animal form, but they do have two interesting powers. One is instant teleportation from one location to another, and another is telepathic communications between vampires. And it's unspecified how far these powers extend, what the range is. We know it's not unlimited because we know there are cases where they cannot get from one place to another because it is daytime. <laughs> if they could just teleport anywhere, they could just poof into the shade somewhere on the other side of Tokyo. No, it doesn't work that way. And they could just talk to each other, you know, like it's a cell phone. Nope. Now, since this is Japan, there is nothing about holy water or crosses that uh, affects these vampires. And they even mention that as kind of a side in one of the later episodes. Now, one of the interesting wrinkles is why some of the vampires 
It's unclear why behave more like shambling zombies. They've like lost their minds. All they want to do is feed. And in the instant they were converted. Of those that keep their wits, some are cruel and don't mind you know, treating humans like cattle. Others have retained their humanity and they really have a lot of sympathy towards their former co-humans. There are several interesting parallel story threads. One, as I said, involves Code Zero, and they are fighting the vampire outbreak. And so some of them actually are vampires, because many of the protagonists in this story are vampires, the ones that have retained sympathy for the human race. There's another one involving Masaki, who moves from the country to Tokyo to become an actress, and she becomes an instant celebrity playing Salome in Oscar Wilde's play by that name. It's an interesting choice. I think it actually kind of um, factors in. It's kind of symbolic of what's going on. I mean, because it's about temptation and so on. So Salome was by Oscar Wilde. It's got all this religious significance, but it was banned in Britain. It was staged in France, but Oscar didn't get to see it. Why? He was in prison. He was locked up for being a homosexual. And it probably wouldn't happen to him, but he was like suing some guy for slander or something like that. And he didn't think of the fact that the guy could say, well, this guy is a sodomite. Arrest him. So poor Oscar didn't get to see his play. But we see several excerpts from this in the show. And it's about uh, Salome. I think she was the daughter or the niece or something of King Herod in Jesus' time. And uh, she was supposed to go seduce John the Baptist, but he didn't bite, so he ended up having his head delivered on a platter. <laughs> anyway, so Misaki is this actress that becomes the toast of the town. And there's also another girl that comes from the country, and her name is Aoi. Uh, wonderful, wonderful name without any consonants in it. And she is working for a tabloid newspaper, a very small operation, and she's intent on chasing stories about vampires, you know, since a lot of people believe in them, even though the government denies their existence. So there are a lot of fun vampire protagonists. Uh, in one case, a lot of the soldiers of Code Zero become vampires. And I don't recall whether it's intentional. I think it's kind of accidental. I mean, they get bitten or they might have been, you know, in mortal danger. You know, they might have been wounded and they think, well, the only way is to become a vampire. Take some of that vampire blood and now I'm going to live on. Uh, one of the cool characters is a mad scientist. He's a vampire called Takeuchi and he is working on all these inventions to try and make vampire's existence better, like sunblock. <laughs> and he is also working for the military. Contain the vampire plague. There's another couple of cool characters. One is a young child actor. Well, he's actually not actually young. He's like hundreds of years old, but he looks young. His name is Defrat. He lives in the theater and he acts in many of the productions, but people don't realize that he's not really a child. And so he is kind of the voice of the show in a way. He expresses a lot of the angst about, you know, living on and not aging and not being part of the human race and not being able to come out in the daytime. There is another character called Sua, and he's an odd duck, also part of Code Zero, and a good associate of Takeuchi, but he always wears a mask. Sometimes it's a decorative mask, uh, sometimes it's a gas mask, and I don't recall ever understanding why. You know, is his face horribly disfigured? Well, you have to watch it to find out. Another of the mysteries that's going on in this show is that there's a new breed of vampires that act like shambling zombies. They're just hungry for blood. And Code Zero's speech doesn't work on them. You know, they're just going, ah, you know, and then they try to bite the soldiers. Uh, no, they can't be reasoned with. So the military creates another unit that's made of vampirized soldiers who are like mindless, or at least they seem mindless. And they are the brainchild of Lieutenant General Nakajima. These vampire soldiers, they are encased in this kind of armor. And they have these huge clubs. And they go after the raging vampires with clubs and just club them into 
non-existence. And there's also historical, true historical aspects. Uh, this happens in Tokyo, and there's the famous districts, entertainment districts we've heard so much about, uh, like Yoshiwara and As Asakusa, uh, that we're familiar with from Woodpecker Detective's office. And also, there's the skyscraper Ryunkaku, the very first skyscraper from Japan, which is 12 stories and was wrecked in the 1923 Great Kanto Earthquake, which is when this show happens. And they show this devastated landscape, and you think, that's got to be unreal. They're just exaggerating this. No, they're not. <laughs> There's photographs from that time. The place was just in rubble. I enjoyed the characters. The characters are wonderful, and how humans deal with the vampire plague, and how some of the vampires deal with their vampirism, and whether they're going to be loyal to the human race or to some of the other vampires, like the... Uh, some of the wicked characters, some of the antagonists, such as Rufus Glenn, he's a Brit. Uh, he is in involved with these noble vampires he brought with them. They are the worst kind, the ones who just want to exploit humans, and they are groundlessly, needlessly cruel. A couple funny things about this show that I thought were interesting to note. Uh, one is the reference to flappers. This is the 20s, after all, you know, flappers being the shocking. Uh, scantily dressed for the time, women that were popular in the 1920s who frequented nightclubs, etc. So Aoi, the um, journalist girl who is cute as pie, uh, refers to herself as a flapper and she says, count on a flapper to get it done, which is kind of funny because flapper was a derogatory term. I had an argument about Mrs. Desperado on this and I looked it up and I think I might have been right. Flapper actually comes from a old British slang term for prostitute. And I think they were called flappers because they were known to be kind of morally loose, you know, kind of a little easier with their favors than the typical girl of the 1920s. So to have her refer to herself as flapper is kind of jarring. And so the only other thing I have to complain about this show is that sometimes it's a little confusing, you know? Well, this is a common problem with anime in that some of the characters look pretty darn similar. And it's not just, you know, my European look at, oh, Asian characters looking the same. No, for some reason, the character design is not different enough. And the two primary females, uh, Misaki and Aoi, uh, at one point I was confused. When they came to town, they had the same kind of dress and haircut very long hair, and I thought, oh, is this, I thought she was a journalist. Uh, now she's acting? No. <laughs> once once um, Misaki cuts her hair into a more modern 1920s style, then you know who she is, and, and she's distinguishable, which is good. A little confusion there. The last episode in particular is rather baffling. I may have to watch it again. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it pretty much has resolved the story. But it's still a pretty good anime, and I do recommend it. This has been my review of Mars Red, the very interesting, very fascinating historical Taisho era anime about vampires. Let me know what you think in the comments. Please like and subscribe, and check out my books on Amazon. Links are in the description. For now, the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Mm -hmm.